Thank you for joining us today for Architecture for Light, Heirloom Ideas, Modern Semantics, and Current Realizations. And what we will be discussing today is the architectural form and how it can be uh, designed to embrace light in a way that helps the lighting designers realize the true nature of the architecture itself. And we are Kim and Paul Mercier. We're lighting designers and creative collaborators. And what a creative collaborator to us means is that although we have the educational and technical backgrounds to support lighting design in an architectural team, and we are past presidents of the IES, all of these credentials make us creative in that we have the tools we need to answer the questions and find the best results for projects. And the true benefit today of that type of background is that we can become energy artists. And although energy is seen as a restriction or a constraint for many design teams, for us, it's an opportunity to use our creativity to find beautiful solutions within the constraints that we all have to face as designers as we're embarking on finding solutions for perfect projects. Every program and presentation starts with an idea or two or three or four. And this particular program uh, was born from the notion that just like signature architects, lighting designers have a signature lighting design style. And for us and our firm, we recognized it when our newest staff members and even the children of our staff members would walk around an environment and actually ask us if we had been involved in the lighting on a particular project because it looked like us. And as we started discussing this and, and sharing the design ideas and concepts with our staff, uh, we thought about whether or not pursuing an educational uh, format and curriculum in the form of a master's thesis to support the work that we knew intuitively would help us create something that we could then convey to other people more easily, not just our staff members. And we got a, a kickstart when a colleague of ours made a very alarming statement which implied to us that perhaps the future of the lighting designer was going to be so constrained by energy legislation that the lighting design as a, as a practice would cease to exist. So we said we better get going and we had to create something that would actually follow cultural learning in that if I was speaking to architects or interior designers or uh, structural engineers, I needed to understand their language of communication so that I could help them design great spaces to accept light. And as we were following a pattern of establishing what that cultural learning would be, we created a book and we've done presentations. And this goes right to the point of, of just talking and practicing the exact thing that we are teaching and we do it every day. This overview of this program today is to talk about finding design considerations for creating a built environment that actually embraces light. So we're going to explore heirloom ideas, lighting design language development over time, and our modern realizations that help us align that language and that intent with uh, what we need to practice today. We start by looking, if we, if we realize there's a disconnect, we start by looking at where that might have occurred so that we can understand the true nature of a problem and solve it and work to solving it. So if we think about what may be the original disconnect in terms of how we light today compared to how we used to light intuitively, we realize that there used to be a lack of an option uh, until we had electric lighting, the only lighting we had was naturally occurring lighting. And the lack of that option actually made us really great designers because our immersion in light every day gave us an innate understanding and made 
lighting intuitive. So we were connected to nature's light for not just vision, uh, but health. And today we're learning a lot about lighting and health, but we have to relearn it. And there was a time when we were just healthy because we were living in nature's light alone. And because intuitively we understood the importance of light, it also led to a spiritual connection to light in a way that helped early designers like the, the Anasazi, the Pueblo Indians, the Egyptians, build their structures to recognize the spirituality and the importance of light. And if you look specifically at like the Pueblo Indians and the Anasazi, their architecture embraced light in a way that put apertures and fenestrations to accept light on solstices, right? So light to them did more than provide an environment to live day by day. It actually marked time and became a calendar for life. And the Egyptians, their pyramids, their burial tombs had shafts which allowed the light to come in from sacred stars. We're going to move into a little bit of a, a different topic from that original disconnect in the sense that we're going to talk about lighting design from an architectural perspective, from, uh, from an office perspective. Uh, we want to talk about the idea of efficiency and what efficiency uh, is as far as a space is concerned. So the image that you see in front of you today uh, on the right hand part of the screen is one that is very familiar to all of us. It's an office space. It's been illuminated with standard uh, two foot by four foot recessed lighting fixtures. Uh, and when you look at the environment that it's in, there are a number of things that you're going to notice almost immediately. One of them is that there are no windows in this space. So for people who are occupying this space, if you think back to the, to the previous slide and, and Kim's discussion about how we uh, bring light into a space, there is no uh, light, natural light in this space. So that is one of the things as far as efficiency is concerned. The other thing, and we're going to talk about this a great deal, is the geometry of the space and the materiality of the space has, uh, has an, a complete effect on the efficiency of the illumination and how it's delivered to the space for use. So for instance, there are cubicles within this environment that all absorb light in some way or another. Honestly, we, we used to know how to be great daylight designers. And what I think has happened in this original disconnect is we've, we have a broken chain of apprenticeship. And this particular image shows a very famous building. It's the Larkin Soap Company headquarters administration building, which was in Buffalo, New York, circa 1906, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And what is fascinating about this building, which unfortunately was lost in, in the 50s, is that when you look at the exterior of the building, it is visually massive. There, the fenestration placements, the setbacks, the facade articulations, where the windows are placed, it looks like a large, brutalist, concrete bunker on a streetscape. And when you look at this photo, you can see how visually massive this building is because there's a person on the sidewalk in front. And it is very difficult to imagine how daylight of any kind will get into this building. But these are pictures of the actual interior. And the building itself was designed to perform like a luminaire. And if you think about why that may have been the case, is when these architects and their ideas were being formed, daylight was still the best option for uh, allowing people to work inside a building and see what they were doing. So for me, this, this is one of the most amazing facilities that, that we look at as far as a historic value of a particular type of design. 
when you look at the space, there's actually interior lighting that uh, surrounds all of these people that are on that main hall, that main floor, and yet none of it is on in these images. And it is our belief that they actually did not turn that light on because they did such a great job at bringing natural light into the space that it wasn't required. Now think about this. This was before we had the energy crisis, before we had uh, uh, concerns about sustainability and energy, and they did it just naturally. And we got away from that at one point in time, and hopefully uh, we're moving now towards what we used to know very, very well. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, where the uh, original modern lighting designers come from. And, and there's a reason for that. When we were doing our study to, to find out exactly uh, where the disconnect took place, we realized that we had to go back to the original modern lighting designer and, and find out exactly who and where things came from and where our concepts came from. And we were quite surprised actually that the, the person that everyone believes uh, in, at least in our industry, who is the father of modern lighting design was actually, actually had a mentor. And that mentor who is really what we consider the true lighting, modern lighting designer is Stanley McCandless who was a theater lighting designer. And that uh, Stanley McCandless at the time actually took theatrical lighting approaches and brought them into homes. So he was designing uh, homes and um, using techniques that he learned in the theater. And when you think about the techniques that they used in the theater, they, they exaggerated items so that you could get a sense and a feel of, a, of what was going on in a play. So if there was something that was surprised, they would see the surprise. If there was something that was a, an emotional feeling to it, they were capable of doing those things. So Stanley McCandless actually, um, actually was the original person. What I find the most interesting is we have some modern lighting designers that still exist today that are around that we speak to on a regular basis. Some of them are actually my mentors in, uh, in lighting. And those um, designers actually all worked for Stanley McCandless. So the one person that we think about quite a bit is Richard Kelly. And Richard Kelly is a person that started a language for architectural lighting. He expanded McCandless's ideas into the commercial world where he was able to use uh, the techniques that he had learned at what I consider the master's feet. And, and we always look to Richard Kelly designs, even today, for mm -hmm. the quality of the, the illumination of those particular spaces. But I, I think he's credited for more than that and what he's created what he did create was a language that was uh, utilized poetic metaphors. And I think that that is very important to understand why he did that. One was he was trying to communicate very particular ideas and concepts to the layman, to a homeowner, to uh, someone who would own a commercial office building or, or any type of application in, in, uh, in the world. And when he was doing that, he wanted to do two things. One was to communicate what he was trying to do as far as lighting was concerned. But the other one was to be able to leave an open concept. When you use po poetic metaphors, there is a lot of interpretation that is still available to you. Let's talk about the modern disconnect between Kelly's poetic metaphors and what we do with lighting design today. So when we think about the different terms that Kelly used, he used a uh, term such as uh, ambient luminescence. And the ambient luminescence essentially is the feeling of the space. It's how the overall lighting uh, affects the architectural environment that you're in. Focal glow is something that draws your attention. So it has probably a, a little bit higher illumination level so that it draws your attention. So when you think about ambient luminescence, it's general illumination, focal glow, brings your attention. And the last one is a play of brilliance. And the play of brilliant actually uh, draws your attention in a very focused manner and brings joy to the environment that you're in. So what, what became of those? So today, we actually use terms such as general or ambient uh, illumination of the space. So general illumination of the space. We look at task lighting, which instead of it being something that was an overall feeling of the space has now become specific for a task itself. That's what we use that term. And accent or sparkle. And accent is really creating an illumination on a very specific focused element. So sparkle, 
which is the one that is the most difficult to, uh, to be able to define for most people, has become the jewelry within the room. So it could be a chandelier, a crystal chandelier, or an LED luminaire that has a high uh, brightness value. I wanted to add that in, in terms of the, the poetry transitioning to something that we understand, I think it's common for people who have difficulty with poetry to try to define it in a way that they can then repeat the process. So I think it's a natural progression over time of trying to understand a difficult concept, which gave you a lot of room for creativity and interpretation, and trying to make it something that more people could implement more of the time. And that's where the poetic nature of the language was lost. And, and that leads us to how math then becomes research. So in our search for something that be able to allows us to get from poetry to something that is applied on a daily basis, there was a search by a number of different people to see whether we could uh, actually affect the feeling of a space just based on the illumination. So Professor John Flynn actually did some research in a conference room. And in that conference room, he looked at a number of different variables. But his goal was really to see whether he could change the impression of a space by just changing the illumination. And although that research is very difficult to repeat at this point, uh, a number of different researchers have tried and have been unsuccessful because they've changed minor elements within that research. They, the successful thing that he did do that everyone agrees on is the perimeter illumination or illumination of the vertical surfaces within a space are very important and can affect the, uh, the entire feeling and architecture of that space. And to the modern design team, uh, what this means is that we should reconsider the geometry of our spaces during early design efforts so that we can consider our structures as enclosures of light. And by doing so, we allow the geometry of the space to affect the efficiency of delivering light to where the occupants of the space actually need the light. And this means we think about, in a considered manner, the articulations of the space, the surfaces, the, the colors that we are using, and we actually continually ask ourselves as a design team, does this make sense if what I want to do is efficiently deliver light to the areas in my building which are being used by people? And it's beyond the energy efficiency side of it. It's literally the efficiency of how a building is occupied and operates going forward. So that leads to the idea of complexity and, and complexity in these spaces actually uh, affects the amount of illumination that's delivered to the space. So one of the things we'd like to move on and talk about is the idea of transfer of illumination. This is a definition that we're going to use throughout the series. The transfer of illumination is really the concept that a light source is actually transferring its, uh, its illumination to another object. So when you think about the moon, for instance, the actual light source is the sun. The sun uh, reflects light off of, the, off of the moon and that moon illuminates uh, the earth during nighttime. So that concept happens in a lot of architectural environments as well where we are trying to use hidden lighting instruments in order to be able to provide illumination to the space. And it transfers the light to vertical surface, horizontal surfaces. And by doing that, it creates a vision of how that space is, uh, is put together in the end. So it, it brings us to uh, how do you design that enclosure? And I think it's really important to understand that really it's a proportionality in some cases of floor to ceiling to wall ratios. And when I talked about the idea that the light gets transferred to those uh, surfaces, it's really we're talking about the idea of absorption and reflection. And if you think about this particular uh, building, it's the Chapel in Valesaron, uh, by the Sancho Madreras Architectural Group, they 
they created a, a beautiful space by just bringing daylight into the space without actually having any lighting instruments visible from anywhere. The next important concept to discuss is verticality. And, and what does verticality mean? And to me, um, verticality is, is standing up so you can see further. It's experiencing volume and not just, not just the work plane that you're thinking about. So in design, the ability to see more and perceive more and experience brightness is dependent on how we treat the vertical surfaces. And historically, it was a difficult thing for us to think about because the math had us thinking about what was in front of us on, on the tabletop as we were working. And I think that what is fortunate today is that we've actually evolved to have more of our tasks be performed head up. We write less, we look at computer screens more. And that allows us to move away from the concept of how much illumination do I have on this surface in front of me? And it allows us to question our historic manner of calculating the amount of light here and say, does it make sense for us to think about how much light is in the vertical planes? Because that's where we're looking and that's where we're perceiving brightness. And there are secondary benefits, which are almost more important to me, uh, vertical illumination and considering the vertical surfaces helps improve communication and the reading of visual cues. And um, in, a, in a time when we spend most of our time communicating via text messages and email messages, we've almost lost the art of looking at a person's face and understanding if they're happy, if they're upset, if we've said something that offended them. And what we find is that if you do a better job illuminating facial features, communication is improved extraordinarily, really. And if we think about the theatrical scene and we, we go back to Stanley McCandless and let's move theater into life and make life more about theater, uh, in theater, they use emotion masks, which are extreme representations of emotions, happiness, surprise, sadness. And emotion masks were developed so that the person in the last seat, in the last row, in the back of the theater, actually understood what was going on on the stage. And today, these types of emotion masks are actually used to train people who have difficulty reading others, how feelings are transmitted through emotions and facial expressions and can help you communicate better. If we take it back to John Flynn's uh, original concepts and, and uh, discussion about how that uh, research was performed, it was done in the 1970s and in the 70s, we were still a heads down type of society. And communication wasn't really looked at at that particular time for research. It was really task oriented design. Today, almost all of our communication is done in a heads up fashion. So these, these masks are, are my favorite uh, image actually that we come up with that allows us to be able to understand how important lighting is to reveal people's expressions. So a lot of times when, uh, when we're talking to someone, we're actually reading their facial expressions. We're not, we're listening to their words, but if their words do not uh, agree with their facial expressions, we can see that if their space is well illuminated and if their face is well illuminated. So after we think about verticality and the benefits of considering vertical surfaces, we, we need to address material physics. And, and that sounds kind of scary, the physics of materials. But the reality is the choices we make for our finishes within our building can improve the lighting outcome. It can certainly affect the lighting outcome, or you might end up with a completely unexpected result because it doesn't seem to match with the math. And so when we think about material physics, it's a lot of things. It's pigments, which we're all used to working with, with paint colors. And we understand that if we select a deep red, 
the room will appear different than if we select a uh, sunny yellow. But it's also absorption as it's related to textures. And uh, if, I, if I crinkle up a piece of paper, all you have to think about with texture is if, if you go through the act of adding texture to something, you are adding more surface area. As soon as you have more surface area, you are absorbing more light. So the lighting outcome will be different. And if you think about taking something with a texture and pulling it tight so that all of the texture is gone, you can understand that you have more surface area from that textured element. So the selection of textures, fabrics, colors, geometry, all of these things begin to be direct contributors that people understand to the outcome in a lit environment. We frequently forget to talk about people because <laughs> it's a lot more convenient to design a space without people and to actually calculate how the lighting outcome is going to be if there are no people in the space. But if you have a conference center or a, a large venue that is normally not occupied, and if you've done all of the finish selections, so it's white, white floors, light grays, and you have great illumination when no one is there, what happens when you have a queue that has a thousand people in it? And how does that affect your lighting outcome? Does it matter? The answer might be no. It, it might not matter at all. But, but I think as the design team, we should think about those items. It's interesting that you bring that up, and because one of the reasons why uh, we we design the way we do is because we have realized that a majority of our traditional ways of doing lighting calculations don't integrate people into the spaces whatsoever, and the absorption of light in this particular space is probably around thirty-five or forty percent of the illumination that's actually delivered to the space. So when the original calculation was done for the space of how much light was needed for it, it was probably done with an empty room. And if you think about the impact of having people in those spaces, you would have to augment the illumination that was provided in the original design by 30 or 40% in order to be able to get the achieved or the desired results um, that was the theoretical outcome that you were trying to achieve. So. People absorption in space is really probably one of the most important things that we have to move into a direction where we do consider people in these spaces, as you'll see throughout the presentation. So creating the unexpected. The last thing that we want is a sterile space. We want a space that is interesting to people, and that actually requires uh, different uniformities, different highlights in the space. It makes it so that you want to be in the space. And this is a, an, an incredible building that uh, that looks at non-uniform brightness. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about um, creating the unexpected. We're looking at contrast ratios or high contrast ratios. And what I mean by that is, is low brightness to high brightness. That's what a ratio is when it comes to lighting. So if you were to start out with a, uh, a lighting level that is based on a recommended practice that says in a church to be able to read um, the... Uh, the material that you're using for that particular um, sermon or, or whether you're reading a hymn book or whatever that is. Uh, if you were to start out that what that level is for that, in order to create contrast, um, you would have to multiply that by at least a five to one ratio to get a, a decent uh, contrast that a human a visual system would be able to be able to see. So if you start there, that's a problem because in our energy codes of today, it's impossible to actually be able to have that five time illumination and still meet the energy code. So what do you do? What is the solution? Well, instead of starting out with the recommended practice, what you need to do is start looking at things such as where you're going to highlight and select a baseline that is much lower than the actual, uh, the actual recommended practice. And then what you do is you come back to uh, to the recommended practice at the end of that uh, process and supplement the lighting so that you can create a contrast that's much more efficient. I think an important uh, aspect of learning how to establish contrast and hierarchy in, in spaces is the notion that you have to start with an absence of light. 
and we should we should embrace the absence of light and, and darkness as an important tool for lighting designers to establish this uh, punctuation and, and it's punctuation in the language of lighting if you look at this uh, picture of the consigerie in, in Paris, France, um, this is a prison. And do you, do you make a prison corridor feel warm and inviting and, and, and exciting and bring you joy? No, probably not. So maintaining darkness here makes perfect sense. And adding a highlight so that it can reveal the form and the length of a corridor as you're as you're walking to a cell becomes dramatic, and and it tells you exactly what this space is. It's not a joyful space. It's it's something more than that. And if you look at the the hall of the guards in in the consigerie, um, you notice that we see that the lighting effect and the instruments are located on the tops of the capitals and they take the architectural feature in the space, which is the grandest feature, and the ceiling. And they illuminate the ceiling, and using transfer of illumination, you end up with enough light within the space to reveal the floor, everything below the capitals, even though there is no light directed in the volume, aside from highlighting the beautiful ceiling. So the conscious decision to keep the floor dark with the exception of illumination that was being transferred actually reveals the beauty of this architecture. And this space is quite comfortable. It's not a very high light level. The picture probably shows uh, it being brighter than, uh, than one would experience when one was in the space. But the incredible part about it is that you can see the the actual volume of this space, you can see the geometry, and in the distance, which is probably a couple of hundred feet uh, to the end of this, you can actually see that back wall. So there's no surprises. In the, in the first image, there was obviously surprise, but that's what we wanted was surprise, so that you didn't know what was at the end of the corridor. In this particular case, we wanted to see what was at the end of the corridor, and and the space itself doesn't require any additional downlighting. What is truly interesting about this particular building and how it's illuminated is all of these lights are incandescent. They're actually in a very simple porcelain socket holder sitting on top of the capitals and they are uplighting a building that was created in uh, close to 1200, I would, I would say, yeah, is that yeah. so? Um, around that particular era and they the lighting designer decided to do it in a very simplistic way but a very effective way and the reason for that is because he started out with the absence of light didn't didn't put light where it wasn't required the ref put light where it was required and the resultant of the space is truly magnificent in my opinion with light and direction I it's important to understand that because we evolved as humans with, with sunlight and overhead lighting, we take a lot of information in from our environment, which helps us establish uh, directionality, uh, movement, if, if something's running towards us. And we use the travel path of light and the interruption of light to create those shadows to help understand our environment better. And it actually helps our brains work faster because if you have a shadow, you intuitively understand the, the source of the light is coming from this direction. And you can use the creation of shadows and silhouettes to actually transmit information and to help people evaluate and understand a space more quickly. So the use of shadows and silhouettes to transmit information about the space gives us ideas about the origin of the source, where the light's coming from, perhaps the time of day, the size of the object. You can frequently tell by the way the shadow is casting. And a, and a good example of how you can use shadows to your advantage is this particular shadow art where you take a, a crumpled piece of paper and it reveals the profile of a person. And to a lighting designer, I think the important takeaway from that is uh, you can use shadow and transmit information 
that actually confuses people. There's not a real person standing there and you're not really seeing their profile. You are looking at a crumpled piece of paper that looks like a person. And this confusion technique, if it's planned for and you meant to achieve it is, is important, but if it was an outcome that you did not expect, then you you start having problems with your clients and with the the end result of the the project so an example actually a true life example is one that i learned from christopher cuddle kit cuddle who is uh, a very experienced lighting designer from new zealand was uh, talking to me about a project that he undertook and one of the things that he looked at when he looked at this particular exhibit project it was a museum was what he termed as flow of light and uh, and kit has a lot of ideas on uh, flow of light and directionality of illumination and it was his job to actually solve a problem within this uh, particular exhibit space uh, they'd never felt the lighting was correct and he walked in and said you know what's wrong with this and he said well, the whole setting is is actually been lit backwards, where they were expected to walk through the space in a particular direction, and the illumination actually came from the opposite direction. And that created such confusion in the space that the exhibit space was not successful. When he went back and modified that space so that the light was in the was in the appropriate direction, they actually changed the entire flow of the exhibit space based solely on the lighting itself. And then they ended up having much greater success and commentary back from the people that were in those spaces. So let's continue about that idea that Kim talked about, which is this ability to remove or increase, um, increase confusion in a space. So when we think about levels of stimulation, I think this is really important. We can get, we can get spaces that are just provide too much stimulation, too much contrast. If you think about Times Square or Las Vegas, most people recognize the fact that after a certain period of time, they feel slightly agitated when they're in those spaces. And the reason why is because their brain is working so hard in, in order to be able to interpret very mixed ideas and, and concepts because of the, the really bright versus the dark uh, contrast. So when you think about these two particular spaces, the one thing that we try to do is avoid places that muddle or avoid too much light, too much brightness, too much contrast that creates a confusion in the space because our brains get tired of being in those spaces rather quickly. When you think about that, there's, there's an ability to be able to either reinforce the expected or, or create a contradiction. Now, I love this image, and the reason why I think this is a great image is because it brings me back, right back to Richard Kelly's play on Brilliance. When you think about the, the shadow, the, the brightness in this space, it creates that joyful feeling that I believe he was talking about. It's truly that poetic metaphor, but it also reveals the space, even though it is quite complex as far as light and shadow is concerned. I think that the, the planned natural illumination that comes within this, uh, within this structure is really a great example about how to create an environment that has all components. I'm gonna take you to the opposite side. So if it, we're gonna talk about efficiency of design. So let's consider the ideal room for delivering light. There are no people, there's no contrast. The volume has been optimized to be able to deliver light to the space. It has no color and it's simple, simply lacking in complexity. When we talk about that type of design, that is not what we believe in. It's just that if you were to keep that in the back of your mind saying, this is the most ideal room, how do we either want to get away from that or how do we want to come back to it if we need to? So I think the idea of considering that ideal room for illumination is quite important to have as a foundation, not because that's where we want to be, but we want to be truly informed as the resultant of anything that we add. Because frankly, these spaces that we're creating are for people. If you remember the argumentative question that we were thinking about, or the ar alarming question was, can you design spaces for people today? I think this is one of the important elements that we need to suddenly change then to the efficiency of design of those spaces. So you need to consider material physics, you need to consider absorption and texture within those spaces because they affect the ability to deliver light to the space. Pigments, and don't forget, people absorb light. 
So we did a little study, and I think it's important to look at this uh, study. The spaces are designed for people. This is the ideal room where we actually put one person for every 100 square feet. If you like our mannequins, they are actually put in in uh, a lighting software program. And what we found after doing this study is just by having these people in the space that we actually reduce the uh, amount of light that is available for task use by 25% or greater. That's an incredible impact on a small room like that. So right before you, before you start evaluating the illumination uh, for the space, you have to consider that people uh, are in there and absorb that type of light. So uh, to summarize heirloom ideas that are relevant today, uh, I think we need to reconstruct the apparently broken apprenticeship and experienced people who have project experiences and life experiences in lighting are really needed to, to go out and mentor our emerging professionals. So we have EPs in terms of experienced people and emerging professionals. And I think it's, it's imperative that we all focus on transmitting what we know so that they have the opportunity to to establish what lighting design will be in the future. If we go back to the original meanings of language and we reintroduce the poetry, although not every one of us is great at poetry, it offers us a little more freedom to be creative and to find better solutions than simply calculating a mathematical outcome, which may or may not support our architectural visions for spaces. And if we think about creating the space to consider volume and geometry impacts, and we do that at the beginning, it, it's very helpful to the design team because the outcome is going to be closer to what you were hoping. So uh, plan brilliance as, a, as an original discussion, it could be the sparkle of light off a bronze bear statue, right? And thinking about geometry impacts in a, in a room that has 30 foot high ceilings to accommodate a totem pole is going to be important if you're trying to locate your lighting instruments to, to realize the grandeur of that space. So to support those heirloom ideas with current realizations, think vertical, we stand up, we look upright, we see more, there, we experience more, there's more brightness if we consider our vertical surfaces. Maintaining an absence of light, it occurs in nature. It should be intuitive to us, but as lighting designers, we think about applying light first. And we really need to dial that back and think about uh, also being the keepers of darkness, because I think that is an important uh, philosophy to have. By doing so, by entrusting ourselves to keep the darkness, we give ourselves the freedom to establish a hierarchy and a flow of light that makes sense to people. And all of these things will impact the efficiencies of our realized spaces. So yes, we can continue to be relevant in an era where we have energy codes uh, constraining our every move when it comes to design. So if you would like more information about what we discussed here, uh, we have a presentation about lighting design in the era of energy codes, which actually takes this discussion and uh, provides examples and application case studies so that you can better understand exactly what we were talking about here. And if you're more of the type of person who gets their information from reading books, the book Architecture for Light actually expands on all of these ideas so that you can reference it in a reading format instead of a visual format. Paul and I welcome questions anytime. We've provided our email addresses, so by all means, feel free or contact the Illuminated Engineering Society and their educational support staff would be thrilled to hear from you and to answer any questions that you may have about lighting and lighting design.